you, I want us to remember it. And as we celebrate the Lord's Supper today, I want us to remember that, that, that that's what Jesus did for us. Jesus took our sin, Jesus took our shame, so that we didn't have to go into eternity uh, separated from God. Okay? That's pretty awesome, right? All right, boys, we're going to talk about have a seat. Thank you all so much. I do 
appreciate uh, them doing that on our behalf today. Uh, it was just not possible to have it ready before Black Friday. Yeah, it would have been good last time, but wow, we uh, we get our priorities all turned upside down, do we not? And uh, I'll tell you what, Jeff, if you want to bring me one of those, this guy's already squealing. L3, there you go. Now, can I come back over there? That's the question. All right. When we talk about our priorities and then we come to the Lord's Supper, why would those two things be integrated? And that's kind of what we want to talk about today. As we talked about what Christ has done on our behalf and what was the, the effort that he was making, what was the point? Uh, is to deal with sin. And so because of his great love for us, God decided that for all those who would believe, he would give them eternal life, forgiveness of sins, and all of these incredible things that we experience and know as children of God. And so when we come to this time, how do we then honor him? How do we evaluate ourselves where do we turn to make sure that the life that we're living is in keeping with the master that we serve? Because of those things, we want to look at some scriptures and we'll start off with part of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians 11, 27. Now this is a thematic one, so we're not going to stay a long time in any of these verses. But you'll have the opportunity to follow along. This particular passage is the one that causes us to encourage our church family and those who are here with us as guests to uh, make sure we, we try to let you know in advance that Lord's Supper is coming. It's a fifth Sunday thing, so you, you can know that it's coming. But this time of examining ourselves uh, to see if in fact the way that we are living and thinking and serving God and serving each other is in keeping with who Jesus is and what he's done on our behalf. If we're acknowledging here in the Lord's Supper that his body was broken and his blood was shed, that we could have forgiveness of sin and eternal life, that we could have his righteousness as he took our sin upon himself, then as we examine our lives, we're looking to see if in fact we know we're living in direct contradiction to who Jesus is. And so this examination uh, was so important that uh, Paul took the time to point out that there are even uh, those who have physically uh, suffered uh, great consequences for not doing this kind of uh, an examination of life. Not just for the purposes of the Lord's Supper, but just in the way that we live. And so what is this thing then that Jesus has done. And so let's look at John chapter 8. And in just a couple of passages from there. Jesus saying to the Jews who had believed in him. So here are believers he's talking to. If you continue in my word. Then you are truly disciples of mine. And you will know the truth. And the truth will make you free. Now this is the perseverance of the saints. Jesus is saying if a person truly has come to faith in Christ. That they will in fact then be changing to begin to live by his word. A disciple follows the teacher. Not only around wherever he walks, but also in the way that the teacher teaches and the way the teacher lives. And so Jesus says you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. But then in verse 36 of the same chapter he says, so if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. So because of Jesus, because of the things he's done on our behalf, we have freedom from the penalty of sin. We have freedom uh, ultimately from the, even the presence of sin. We have been delivered. We have been set free. And so when we see this, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. And then that the son will make you free. Doesn't that connect with the verse? 
It says, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes into the Father except by me. So folks, as we are doing this, it's not an acknowledgement today that we're glad just of what Jesus did way back then. But that He is alive and at well and well and at work in my life and in yours as followers of Christ. Continuing to unfold the gospel, the good news, that He is not just going to uh, uh, say, okay, you don't have to go to hell now because you believe. No, he's, he's going to say, I'm going to be with you every moment of every day of all of your life and trying to draw you and conform you to what is blessed and good about your life. And so as this family talks about their situation, how easy is it for us to get our priorities out of the way? And we begin to pursue the things, the material things, and the, and the things that make us happy, quote unquote, instead of pursuing the one who has pursued us first. And so today, we want to have this experience of making sure that we're walking in freedom, in the freedom of the gospel, and the freedom of who Jesus is and what He's done on our behalf. And so in 1 John chapter 1, we have this promise today as I might have God reveal sin in my life to me that I need to deal with. Am I just going to say, wow, I just, that's, you know, I wish I didn't have to feel bad. I, I just, when I come to church, I don't want to come to church. Every time I come to church, it just makes me feel bad. Well, God doesn't want you to feel bad. He wants you to turn to Him and find forgiveness and eternal love. You see, Adam and Eve, when they had sinned in the garden and they were hiding, I'm sure that as they were hiding, they felt bad. They heard God walking in the garden and I'm sure they felt bad. But what they needed was instead of just putting themselves in that situation was to go to God and say, here's what we've done. And we ask you to forgive us. We repent. We turn away from that choice that we made. Even better. That whenever the temptation had come, instead of then making a decision on their own, they would have gone to God when He'd come to walk in the garden and said, hey, you know the serpent told us this. And, and He told us that maybe you were wrong about that. Can you help us with it? And so the problem that we get into is that when instead of running to the Son for freedom, we run away. And we begin to live our lives sometimes, even as Christians, for things that ultimately will not fulfill. Those things become idols. Anything that I want so badly that I'll sin to get it, anything that I want so badly I'll sin to keep it, has become an idol in my life. And I am worshiping this thing or this desire, or this feeling, rather than the one who is saved. And so we, if we confess our sins, He is faithful, just, and will forgive our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. These are important passages for a Christian to know. It goes uh, earlier in the passage in 1 John 7 and 8. Make sure that we understand, chapter 3, verse 7 and 8, that this experience of sin is something that we all deal with. But look what the Scripture says about Jesus. The reason the Son of God appeared was what? There it is. Y'all tell me. Destroy the works of the devil. And so as I come to the Lord's Supper, as you come to the Lord's Supper, I want to evaluate my life and experience to say, am I joining Jesus in the process of what He came to do? Am I in the process of participating in the destruction, the undoing, the breaking down of the things that the devil has done? Wants to do in my life. Trying to do in our lives, in our churches, in, in our our community. And so here's the goal. That we would follow Christ. And practice righteousness. Instead of allowing the devil to deceive us. As God's children. 
into practicing those things that are seen. Destroying the works of the devil is something that Jesus described carefully during his ministry. Jesus tells us to love one another. So the devil is going to do what? He's going to work to destroy the love that we have for each other. So there are going to be things that will bring up conflicts and crises and things to try to separate us from each other. And we have to recognize that if we're joining Jesus in destroying the work of the devil, we have to look for the opportunity to deal with those things as they come. Jesus calls us to unity. So the devil and his forces work to destroy the unity of the body of Christ. And you'll see churches rise and fall as they go from crisis to crisis sometimes as the, the humanity of us and the sin of us, the things that we do in the flesh, begin to rule and reign in the process. And then a church will go through a time of understanding. And we have to get still before the Lord and we have to have His priorities. What matters to God is what should matter to us. And so we come back together in unity. Jesus calls us to prayer. <laughs> the enemy calls us to distraction. Amen? Amen. You ever tried to pray and just distraction after distraction? So prayer, sometimes that opportunity to converse with God, to hear from Him, to have Him process the Word of God in our lives by the Holy Spirit is something that we often uh, struggle with, and it is certainly something that God can help us be victorious in. Jesus called us to actively work out our differences. And, and the devil calls us to talk about each other rather than talking to each other. So, everything that you see that the devil is trying to do, Jesus came to destroy that work.